you want to know how to raise a puppy with the guarantee of it being the perfect family pet? Do you want a dog that's focused and into you no matter what the distraction? Do you want to prevent reactivity and behavioral problems? Well, if so, join me for today's episode of Lifting All Ships, where you're going to find out all the answers to those questions. Fernandez from Lifting All Ships with my latest episode exploring intentional puppy raising uh, and it's quite a, it's a subject that I'm really really passionate about I love 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 puppies I love getting a puppy I love breeding puppies I love puppy training I love everything about them and I love the process of teaching them new skills from and taking them from blank canvases to hopefully works of art. I've had a lot of dogs in my lifetime uh, and I think I'm my latest puppy. I think I'm up to about 25 dogs of different breeds. So I'm talking really from the perspective of a hands-on dog, dog owner and obviously a professional where I've helped countless people raise their dogs from puppyhood to being elite level dog sports competitors to being just fantastic family pets and dogs that they've won own. I've dealt with dogs that have been in, gone on to do law enforcement. I've dealt with dogs that have gone on to be um, um, in different vocations, whether it be service dogs, dogs to help children with autism, a broad spectrum. And the principles outlined in today's podcast are going to help you no matter what type of puppy and what lifestyle you are going to have with that dog. So there's nothing more exciting about getting a uh, new puppy. I mean, I love the prospect. I'm really impulsive sometimes about my puppy choices. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible for seeing a puppy on social media and falling head over heels in love with it. And I, for me, that's a massive, massive, massive part of dog ownership. I've got a really, really have that connection with my dogs but I have to say it doesn't always come instantaneously with a lot of dogs and certainly dogs in the past that I've owned I haven't had that instantaneous connection with for various reasons and sometimes it takes a little bit more work and not all dogs that I've owned have come with those uh, those almost innate instinct or skills or life skills to slot into my needs and my lifestyle really really easily sometimes it takes a bit of work which is what's evolved me as a both a dog owner and a, uh, a dog behavior consultant and a dog training professional to create a system or a process to raise my dogs with the guarantee of the end result. So if I take you back on a, a life journey somewhat 30 plus years ago when I got my first dog um, and that was a little, um, uh, actually it was a Kelpie cross German Shepherd and she was one of those dogs that so many people have who have that given, that sorry, that God given instinct of knowing what we wanted from her she was always house trained. She was naturally obedient. The first day we got her, we took her out of, on a walk, you know, as the, the resident uh, or the local expert was our neighbor. And the reason they were an expert is because they owned a dog uh, and they were our point of reference. And we took the dog out in, on a walk with no lead on uh, down our road um, in, uh, in Australia where we lived. And um, we walked down the street and we stopped at a curb and she sat. I mean, how many times does puppies do that? And and she was only, you know, really, really young. Uh, we got her from the RSPCS. And I am thankful the process of, uh, or the um, timeline of my dog ownership journey. So she was actually the first dog I ever owned. It was a little, as I said, a Kelpie cross German Shepherd and her name was Dusky. Um, unfortunately, we ended up having to send her back to the RSPCA because at the time, my dad um, had a job uh, in Australia. He'd, we've moved from England over to Australia because he was offered a job. And then he was offered an alternative job back in the UK. So we had to hot foot it back in the UK. And at the time, the quarantine laws were such that dogs had to be kept in kennels for six months. Um, and there was a lot of obviously paperwork and, and it, was, it was much more difficult to bring dogs to and from different countries. Um, we really didn't have the, the money to pay for that uh, and being really honest and it was heartbreaking to send her back at the time. I can remember vividly to the day driving back to the RSPCA and, you know, kicking the back of my mum and dad's car, uh, the, the, the seat in the car, um, 
absolutely distraught at the prospect of wanting a dog for so long and having to send her back. And um, it was a really a, a traumatizing experience. I remember, as I said, vividly. Um, but it's one that I, again, when you when you move through your life, you can see retrospectively. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to me as a dog trainer and as a dog um, professional, a dog behavior professional, uh, and as a future dog owner. So when we came back to the UK, uh, you know, I badgered my parents again for another dog. And we did a, what most people did we, we, at the time is we looked in the local paper. We did want to get a pedigree dog, but at the time the pedigree to dogs were considerably more expensive than crossbreeds. It's probably not the case now with our designer crosses. And we went to the local pet shop, again, a massive, massive error, um, to try and get a dog. And they could, you know, uh, give us any breed of dog that we wanted. We just had to pick it out and they could source it clearly. The puppies were being sourced from a puppy farm. Thankfully, because we couldn't afford to buy a pedigree dog, we had to use an alternative route to source our dog. We tried a rescue, um, we tried to go to Battersea at the time, um, and there was a, a, a Blue Merle Border Collie type that we fell in love with. Unfortunately, she was um, already had a home. Um, so in the timeline, it took us to you know wait for another dog that was suitable or to get up to Battersea to look at the dogs that, that were available. This was pre-internet. Um, we came across the, uh, an advertisement in our local paper, the Newham Recorder, for those of you that know anything about East London. And um, there was an advertisement for a, uh, a Chow Chow Cross uh, puppy uh, looking for a home. And it was, again, it was very dubious. Uh, I look back now and think it was a bit of a dubious situation. So they had this puppy. Um, and when we contacted them, they said that they would bring the dog to us. So that was again a red flag. If I look back now, there's lots of little red flags. Was one is sourcing the puppy from uh, the local paper with no obviously health test or conversation with the the people really about it. What um, the background was to the dog. All we know is that she was a Chow Chow cross, and fill in the blank. Um, and the puppy was at the time she was about six weeks old. Uh, again, a little bit early to get a puppy, but. We you know, naively made the decision to get that little dog and they said they would bring it to us. So again, we never saw her parents, we never saw her mum, we never saw her little mates. And they turned up at our house and they had actually a Rottweiler with them. And that was our test of whether we'd be suitable. So we got to meet the Rottweiler first and then they brought the puppy in to say, yep. Yeah. And they were a, from apparently a rescue. I, I don't know to this day where they were. We never heard from them after we um, took the dog and paid our money. Um, and with no follow-up advice, no um, information about, as I said, the parents, no uh, contact after that point, all massive, massive red flags of getting a dog and things that I've definitely learned for about doing my due diligence and research into uh, the breeder that I'm going to get a puppy from, the breed itself, breed characteristics. Although I was an avid dog lover, um, and I'd re read hundreds and hundreds of dogs books, or certainly, you know, tens of, uh, 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 certainly multiples of tens, I should say, dog books. Um, I really hadn't met a lot of dogs. Um, because culturally, I was from a culture where we didn't have a lot of dogs in my family. Uh, my uncle's neighbour had a couple of Dobermans. That was probably about as much contact as I had with dogs. My family weren't doggy people. So my experience of hands-on practical interactions with dogs was really, really, really minimal. Now, again, classic error. I hadn't uh, um, had any experience with dogs. Again, you can read on uh, or you can go online and find out about dog ownership and you can um, research it to the ends of earth. But until you've been in the trenches actually getting your hands on dogs, it's a very different experience. Whether I, you know, in hindsight, I could have arranged to look after somebody else's dog. I could have taken some a neighbor's dog for a walk. I could have had a dog stay at my home. I could have gone to dog training classes and observed, so familiarized myself with the process, uh, the all consuming process of owning a dog, but we didn't do any of that. As so many people listening to this podcast probably won't. So we ended up with this dog, and those in those days, this was 30 plus years ago, um, we didn't use crates. So we didn't, well, certainly as a domestic pet dog owner, I didn't use a crate with, with that particular dog. And you can imagine what happened subsequently from that. She destroyed our house. Um, she developed lots of behavioral challenges, including resource guarding. She didn't come back when she was called. She was uh, didn't like being groomed because we didn't do any husbandry with her. Um, she was very attached to my dad and not really bonded to me. She was um, she had lots of challenges to overcome throughout her, her life. 
Now, I thank that dog to this day. Her name was Scrunch. And if you go on my Instagram, you can see a picture of Scrunch on one of my uh, photos. Um, where And she really moulded me to be the dog trainer that I am today. If it wasn't for her, and I think of the contrast between her and Dusky. Dusky would have taught me very little. She would have been one of those special dogs that would have just slotted into our lifestyle uh, and our life without <coughs> very or with very minimal um, uh, upheaval or upset. Scrunch most definitely didn't do that. She came with lots of tr uh, challenges. And the challenges that I look at retrospectively were really created by our ignorance as first time dog owners and our naivete as to what owning a dog should actually look like. Subsequently, I learnt really hard, uh, fast and I really quickly um, the repercussions of those inappropriate choices. And as a result of the lessons that I had with her, all my other dogs have benefited from that, that initial um, harsh learning or, or harsh, harsh learning curve of owning a dog. So things that we definitely mistake, uh, made a mistake with was firstly house training. We, did, we didn't understand what house training was. We just thought the dog would come house trained. And, you know, she was a six week old puppy. Again, red flag, shouldn't have had the puppy so young. Uh, and she obviously wasn't house trained. And we didn't have any knowledge. We just thought, oh, we'll take her out for a wee and to go to the toilet and she would be absolutely fine. We didn't understand that she didn't discriminate between in our home and outside. So there was a whole pattern of the dog defecating and urinating in our house, which we had to then break that habit. Ironically enough, we actually litter trained um, Scrunch. We litter trained her and she was a, in the end a really, really, really fastidiously clean dog, almost feline in a lot of her, her, her characteristics and her habits, which would explain, which would be uh, explained by her, her DNA being partly chow. Um, she almost had a, a cat-like uh, temperament. So we overcome that challenge. Next thing was obviously she had no skills. We, we said sit and she didn't sit, funny enough. Well, that again was down to our lack of understanding of the investment and input that we needed to be making to cultivate and nurture this dog from being a blank canvas into a work of art. So moving forward, obviously we, we bore the fruit of those um, bad choices. She was a dog that didn't come back when she was called. She would resource guard terribly. As I said, she was terribly, terribly aggressive when you tried to groom her or cut her nails or look in her ears. She would absolutely bite you. Um, she was good with people. I have to say that about her. Wasn't confident with other dogs, but again, we took her out with dogs way too early. We prematurely socialized her. We socialized her inappropriately. She had a couple of frights in her, um, her youth, which definitely stayed with her. She wasn't reactive or she wasn't dog aggressive, but she definitely wasn't a dog that was overly social with other dogs. Um, I don't think she ever played with another dog as in throughout her life, as far as I can recall. Um, and as I said, the big thing is that me and her as a partnership, we didn't really have a great connection. She was very, very attached to my dad, but not really to me. So moving forward, I learned the lessons from her, which is, as I said, benefited my other dogs moving forward. And I'm much more intentional about the dog that I want to own for 15, hopefully more years. Um, and I think about that when I get them home. So, so this parallel to the way in which I approach hopefully raising my daughter, I'm intentional about what I do with her. I'm intentional about the experiences she has. I'm intentional about the environments that she's put in. I'm intentional about how I talk to her, I interact with her, um, and what she needs to learn to become a hopefully a confident, well-adjusted human being. I parallel that with my dogs. So for example, when I get a puppy home, I'm really mindful of where does that puppy get a, where does that puppy get reinforcement from? And if, for example, that puppy is going to get reinforcement or rewarded for inappropriate behaviour, and then initially I would manage it and I wouldn't allow them to rehearse that. So when you get your puppy home, you need to be thinking about where is your puppy going to rehearse behaviour that you don't really want? So if it means your puppy chewing the curtains, chewing the skirting board, chewing the rug, etc., if you don't want them to that to be formed a habit, then you would prevent or manage them rehearsing that. And you provide them with an alternative uh, option, i.e. chewing toys, chewing bones, etc. You'd create a, put an X pen up so the puppy could be safe and could obviously have freedom so it's not restricted. Um, you could have a crate within that X pen. But again, a little a zone or an area which you can allocate to the puppy where they can rehearse good behaviour and it's not a problem uh, or anything unsafe or inappropriate in that environment. 
for them to access. So that's one of the fundamental things I see with a lot of um, dog owners, where they allow their puppies to rehearse inappropriate behavior and then they retrospectively want to stop it. Now, it might not be the exact same thing. For example, your puppy chewing your rug, you might find a bit like endearing, you know, you might not be bothered, you know, etc. It might be an old rug, but then the puppy getting to tug something or interact with something away from you when it's out in a dog walk and that puppy is distracted by that, that now is an issue so we want to be thinking about not letting our puppy receive reinforcement from inappropriate sources that are either going to be damaging inappropriate or unhealthy to that dog so that's certainly something that we need to consider when we bring our puppies home thinking about the environment they're going to live in and where they're getting reinforcement where they're getting rewarded for what are they getting rewarded for are they getting rewarded for chewing the curtains are they getting rewarded for chasing the cat are they getting rewarded for you know nipping at your children's heels as they run around the garden and so forth and so forth so we want to police that and avoid the puppy rehearsing it now that doesn't mean that your puppy is instantaneously going to stop those behaviours. It means that we need to provide alternative healthy options that can substitute what the dog is showing us. So the puppy that wants to chase things, we need to transfer that desire to chase onto us, which can then be an asset, and we can use that to create that connection. I can become the source of um, joy and excitement from the, for the puppy, which is going to really consolidate our bond and our relationship, okay? Now, what often happens is when people bring their puppies home and they rehearse inappropriate responses, that then impacts their relationship with the dog and other family members within their home. So the puppy is now is not this joyous, fun experience. It's now the hindrance where the puppy is peeing in the house and it's chewing the furniture and it's nipping at the children. All those things can be prevented if we take that moment before we get our dog to really think about who and what we want this dog to be long term. Now, when we get our puppy home, we also need to be think about, thinking about who lives in that environment other dogs, other people, and anybody in that I would consider in our village that are going to be involved with that daily dog's daily care or care in general, the vet, the groomer and so forth, um, people that are going to be part of that dog's life. What do we want that relationship with that person to be? And now we need to be proactive about how we create that relationship. So for example, our dogs at some point are inevitably going to go have to go to the vet. Uh, if you have a coated breed, they're more than likely going to have to go to a groomer. Two part of people that are going to be in your villages, that are going to be in your village, that we were going to call your villages, that we would want to form a really positive association. So before they actually need any care, you'd want to take your puppy to those environments and form a healthy relationship with them. So, for example, with my poodle puppy Beryl. Before she needed grooming and a proper groom, she was took to a groomer where she would give her a bath and she would give her treats and she would engage with her and she'd form a relationship with Belle before she had to do any uh, maintenance of her coat. So she's not in, uh, imposing any stress on her. The relationship is just of um, her, Beryl meeting this person and having a positive experience. Same thing with a vet or a veterinary um, staff, same thing with anybody in your village, whether it be a dog walker, whether it be family members, etc. you want to create that experience. Now, parallel to that, this would fall under the heading of socialization, and the, the, the word that really we need to be thinking about is appropriate socialization. What is the puppy learning in this situation? So if I take that back to raising my daughter, uh, and I explain to you how we go about the same principle. So as part of her, um, uh, our upbringing of her and raising of her, we want her to hopefully be a well-adjusted, kind, compassionate human being that can contribute to society, but is also um, confident, outgoing, uh, and all that stuff, okay? And that isn't just looking to the stars and hoping that it can happen. It's an intentional process. So that would mean thinking about where we socialise her. So she is, um, my daughter Neve, partakes in various clubs and activities. And it isn't necessarily because she's going to be an Olympic athlete or she's going to go to the, the Royal Albert Hall and do a ballet performance. And of course she will because she's brilliant. But it's really about the experience that she's having in those situations. She's meeting other children. Uh, in a semi-controlled environment. She's been given a an activity to do, which is both physical and mental, which is going to boost her confidence. She can do a performance in front of an audience, which is going to give her a little bit of, a, again, a confidence to perform, which when we think about that 
in terms of life, that's going to give her uh, a self-belief and the ability to you know, talk at a conference or in f public speaking or an address, attend a job interview, anything where she has to project herself and, and, and um, convey information to other people. So that's going to help her and that's going to layer the foundation hopefully for her in the future. Thinking about how we implement consequences, how we explain to her and have a dialogue when her behaviour is inappropriate. First and foremost, asking ourselves the question, does she understand what we want of her? Does she understand that as a single child, she has to, and now and again, share with other people. She has to share with her cousins. She has to share with her peers. If we have people at our home, we want her to understand that she has to share her toys with them. How have we taught her to do that? So again, that's a lesson that we've educated her on, that when she shares her stuff with um other children, she gets praised profusely, and every now and again she might get an additional surprise, uh, um, a, a gift or um, or some form of reinforcement for showing good behaviour. Oh, that's brilliant, Neve. Really good sharing today. Let's do. Uh, what's your favourite film? Or let's do an activity together to acknowledge and reinforce you for that really good sharing behaviour. Because she's a single child, that doesn't come naturally to her to share anything that she has. She's uh, able to play with. She can monopolise the time with it. Obviously, as parents, we're happy to go along with her rules and what she wants to do. So there's no necessity for her to share with us any of her items per se. So that's something that we have to incorporate into how we raise her. Parallel that with our dogs, you might have a puppy that needs to be taught to um, about resource guarding and to um, give items up when you when you approach them or to be amongst other dogs and to be social with them. So think about the parallels with how we raise our children to be well adjusted family members and members of the community and human beings. And think about that for our puppies and our dogs. So rather than just what often happens or rather than what can often happen is owners will get a puppy and they make massive assumptions. They take their puppy to the cafe uh, to have a cup of coffee and we make the assumption that our puppy is going to be comfortable in that environment. We take our puppy to the dog park and we make uh, the assumption that our puppy is going to be, have a brilliant recall with those distractions. We make the assumption that we take our puppy to a hotel overnight and they're going to know how to behave and not chew the furniture and not chew the skirting board and not um, pull out the duvet covers and so forth and so forth. We must steer away from making huge assumptions and steer our mind or shift our mind to be intentional about what we want our dogs to do in every single environment that we put them in and every experience they're likely to encounter. And if we think about how we raise children or how children should be raised, we can take that those lessons and apply them to our puppy. So often people will make the assumption that the puppy knows how to walk on a lead. So that in itself is a, a lesson, an educational point that we need to teach our, uh, our puppies. Again, let's think about children. Do our children know how to walk on the road and to go to a crossing? If we let a, a, a two-year-old that just learned to walk out on, in the street, they would run into the middle of the cars, they would probably you know, cross the road without any looking left or right. All those lessons are taught to them. And that education process is what allows them to live a life where they're safe, where they're healthy, where they're a, a, a member of society, and so forth and so forth. And we need to be thinking about that with our puppies. Have we taught our puppy how to walk on a loose lead? Have we taught our puppy what to do when they reach a curb? Have we taught our puppy what to do when they see a vehicle in front of them? Should they ignore it? Should they acknowledge it? And so forth and so forth. Whatever your particular choice is with your dog, think about what you want them to be. So in your head when you get a puppy, have a really clear vision about every single um, experience, every single life choice that you're going to impose on them. And consider and ask yourself the question, am I assuming the dog will know what to do in this environment and in this situation? Or am I being intentional about what the dog will do and what the dog will, how the dog will function in this environment? And we really, <coughs> and we really want to be intentional about the dog's response in those situations. So that also applies to those of you that partake in dog sports. And often, what will people will do certainly when they're raising a puppy for sports is 
uh, one, they will look at the two things as two uh, different, okay? How I want my dogs to operate on a day-to-day -day basis underpins how I want them to be in terms of sport. The two things are interlinked. So if I never did dog sports again, I would still raise my dogs in this way because it ends up creating a dog that has a clear understanding of what I want them to do in any situation that I put them in. It gives them really great social skills because I've been proactive and intentional about how I socialize them. So it, when I do socialize them with other dogs and people, there's a, a lesson to be learned. So today we're meeting a big Labrador. Tomorrow we're meeting a small Chihuahua. The day after that we're gonna meet a, and fill in the blank. Now, I appreciate not everybody's gonna have access to the wide and diverse spectrum of breeds that we have in the world. But if you can think broadly about big dog, small dog, hairy dog, um, you know, different body types, um, different facial shapes, different ear set, think broadly about those things and try and expose your puppy in a healthy manner to those, um, to those life lessons and those dogs. So again, think about children. We would take our tiny baby to a play group where they could interact with children and you'd be there supporting them and they would interact with toys simultaneously but it's all very very controlled so that, n that it's not a case of we put them in a room we leave them or it happens organically necessarily it's done in a very controlled and intentional manner we want to be thinking about that with our puppies certainly when we're socializing them and certainly when there's there's that critical periods of development when they have that initial fear period and moving forward in their life through adolescence when they hit those terrible teens we want to be thinking about the lessons that they're having and whether the lesson that they're going to have or could potentially have is going to be beneficial for the dog that we want to create often what happens with dog ownership and behavior problems is the person hasn't been intentional about the 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 purpose for which the dog is in that situation experiencing that um that life lesson and so forth really think about what is it that you want from your dog what is it that you want them to do in this situation how do you want them to behave do you want them to ignore um people when they're in a cafe do you want them to go to sleep do you want them to relax do you want them to greet people do you want them to ignore dogs do you want them to um be uh, ingratiate themselves to people whatever it is be intentional about how you create that the big thing as well is don't expect them to have those skills either innately or um, um, almost genetically. A lot of dogs, and this is the beauty of dogs, will have a lot of skills come hardwired in them, especially if you do your due diligence and source a really, really good breeder that's done their homework on the dog's temperament and health and so forth. You are starting on a great um, basis to build your relationship if you've got good genetics behind you and good rearing behind you and you've got um, that good initial foundation. If you haven't, if you've got the dog from a, a rescue where, um, for however that's been sourced, um, or, or whether you've got it from, you know, a, a, um, wherever you've got your dog from and the many places that we can get our dogs think about how you want that dog to behave what do you want it to do within your life and start to plan that out from the second that you get it home so thinking about the experiences they have be intentional about your puppy rearing and think about creating that real connection with them I tend not to allow my dogs to socialize uh, indiscriminately with people or dogs because long term, my end goal is them to be neutral or indifferent. Socialization doesn't necessarily mean that they have a physical interaction. It can just be that they observe from a distance. They can uh, walk past another dog and they can do a little bit of casual sniffing and go their separate ways. They can be the presence of people but be ignored by them brilliant life, life lesson for them to have often when people get puppies they want to have everybody wants to um, interact with them and that what you're really doing is you're building a lot of reinforcement history and a lot of excitement and arousal attached to humans which when is in a controlled situation with a tiny puppy not a problem when that dog grows into an adult or bigger and they're adolescent and they see somebody over the park going to work in their nice clean suit and they jump all over them now that's a problem so we need to be thinking about our puppies from day one who and what we want them to be so thinking about the dog that you want to own long term will help you form a plan of how you take them and expose them to different situations for those again those of you that again that partake in dog sports Think about what is it that you want from your dog? Do you want your dog to be focused on you? Do you want them to be totally in tune with what you're thinking? In that case, all these things matter. You know, if you have dogs that are predisposed to certain behaviors, 
For example, motion-driven um, dogs or prey-driven dogs or dogs that like to hunt and sniff, think about how and where you allow them access to that, that particular thing, which is so self-reinforcing to them. If you do allow them to rehearse it independently of you, or away from you, or not attached to you, that can often affect the relationship that you have, where the dog is seeking reinforcement from the environment and not necessarily connecting it with you. Be intentional about your puppy raising, and that will earn you the right to own a dog that's a joy to be around, that's a pleasure to take into different situations, and is an absolute ambassador for all things wonderful uh, related to dogs. But really, really think about your role in rearing the, uh, your, your dog. For me, because I'm so intentional about how I rear my dogs, I'm not gambling about the, the end result of what they may turn out like I am being proactive and it's not to say that every dog's going to tick every single box but there might be some boxes where I think okay there's a bit of management in place and there's a bit of compromise with that dog in that situation for example I might have a dog that um doesn't like uh, I don't know, um, being inside in big buildings. And whilst I can do some training to build their confidence up, if it, my lifestyle didn't permit for them to be in that situation, that would be something I could easily avoid. But if I was a person as I am that needs to take my dogs into lots of different situations, I would be intentional about working on building their confidence. Ultimately, we want our dogs to be happy, joyful, and confident in any situation that we put them in. But that really stems from them understanding what is it that we require of them. So just some thoughts there about raising your dogs with intention. Feel free to put your comments on the post and let me know what you thought about it. Um, and just really, really start to think about who and what you want your dog to be starts from the second that you get them in your home. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lifting All Ships. If you want to make sure that you never miss an episode again, make sure that you hit like and subscribe to get notified of future episodes. Feel free to leave your comments about what you thought about this episode and I look forward to sharing many more with you in the future.